Okay, I think it's a good time to start. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Neha, and I am the project-based intern at the Yara River Keeper Association, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. And this is the most elated discussion panel on women's leadership in water management and environmental protection. Uh, before I start this event, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. The Yara River Keeper Association acknowledges that the Yara catchment is the traditional land and waters of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations. We pay our respect to elders who, are, who have cared for country since time began, to the elders who are healing country today, and to the emerging elders who continue the journey of enriching culture. We acknowledge that the river now, know, now known as the Yara is traditionally known as the Birarang and that name has never ceded to be the name of the river. This country was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, I would like to introduce you to our panelists for this evening. To start with Louisa McMillan who has worked for 18 years as a manager, as well as a CEO at the Mary Creek Management Committee. Our next, pan our next panelist is Anna Rigway, who is a team leader and secretary at the Abbotsford River Bankers. When not river banking, Anna runs her own consultancy in helping businesses. Our third panelist for this evening is Pham Charco, who is a marine biologist at Port Phillip Eco Center, Pham is also a fellow of the Center for Sustainability Leadership in Melbourne. And last but not the least is our very own Karen Traeger. She is the, she's the Chief Operations Officer at the Yarra River Keeper Association. She also is the founder of the Plastic Runner, a social enterprise that facilitates plugging events. Now to give you a bit of an introduction towards the agenda for today. It's gonna to run slightly differently than the usual panels do. It's more like a relay race where our panelists will be interviewing one another. And before we begin uh, this event, there are a few guidelines we would like the viewers to follow. Please keep your cameras and micro microphones off. Please use the Q&A chat box right, on, uh, right at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to our panelists. Uh, these questions will be answered towards the end of this event, if time permits. Any unanswered questions will be tried to be answered through a follow-up later on. This event will be recorded and is currently live on YouTube as well. And please remember to be respectful and kind to one another. I will be handing it over to Karen to start this event. Okay, so um, interviewing Fam. Hi, Fam. how are you? Hi, good. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, well, it's um, kind of really fun to answer your story as well and um, to learn that you actually scuba dive as well. So we have that in common. Um, I also work in the Great Barrier Reef more as a dive master for a few diving companies. So um, I really like your story as well. Um, so my first question is, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge in relation to plastics and water pollution in Melbourne? Oh. Well, there are so many different challenges when it comes to plastic pollution because plastic really goes through such a long life cycle, right? It starts um, as oil in the ground and then there's petrochemical factories involved and plastic manufacturers and transport and retailers and then the users. Um, and then the councils get stuck with the waste and there's waste contractors. So, so there are many different um, ways that plastic pollution gets into the environment and many different uh, people, organization and, and, and um, entities that have to do with this plastic that are affected by it and are affecting it uh, that are involved. So it's, it's a really difficult multi-pronged um, problem. Uh, but I think at the moment, the two biggest problems, I think, are first of all, that uh, there is still a lot of, um, uh, miseducation about plastic and also a lot of non-awareness with, with the general public. So everybody uses plastic, um, but a lot of people, most people don't actually know exactly what it is, what the material is that they're using and how to dispose of it properly. And there's a lot of misinformation all around that doesn't make it easier. You know, there's plastic bag retailers that will 
um, put on their bags, you know, it's 100% degradable, taking care of the environment and all those kinds of misleading information. And people don't know the difference between compostable, biodegradable, degradable, oxo-degradable, oxo-biodegradable plastic bags. So there's a lot of uh, awareness that still needs to happen in mm -hmm. education. And the other issue is uh, that plastics industry are not held, being held accountable for their responsibility of producing a material that lasts in the environment forever. And that lack of accountability is part of the problem that we're seeing worldwide. Yeah, I agree with you in all those points because I've seen the same. Um, well, my next question is, what's been your role with the community in creating change? Um, a few things. I'm very, very lucky to be able to work for the Eco Centre and the fav hands down favourite part of my job is working with the citizen scientists. So the projects that I work on, which uh, are uh, around plastic pollution in the Yarra and Maribyrnong rivers and Port Phillip Bay, and also uh, sunscreen chemicals uh, in Port Phillip Bay and its effect on um, um, uh, microalgae there. Um, both of those projects rely heavily on the help of volunteers from the community. And that is just, it, it is just the best part of my job, really. <laughs> like, these people get me out of bed every morning because without them, um, yeah, this, these kinds of projects would not be possible. And they are making real change. And this is what I like about it because we get all that help at the Eco Center from the community volunteers. We have been able to, um, play a really big part in the advocacy to, to the state government and local governments as well about um, plastic use and changing of legislation as well. So we were involved in um, the, the advisory panels on the ban of, on plastic bags. Um, we went to brief the uh, MPs at Parliament House about the dangers of plastic pollution in Port Phillip Bay. Uh, and we've also been able to use the data collected by the volunteers uh, in association with you guys at the Yarra River Keeper Association um, to have microplastics be officially listed as a threat to waterways. And before that, that was missing. Um, so it, those are quite big wins for the environment, I think, here in, in Victoria. And uh, yeah, it, it feels really good to be able to do that and to be able to report that back to the citizen scientists as well. And, um, you know, just making sure that their contribution is really worth it as well. Oh yeah, I'm very excited to be part of it too. Um, and then my last question will be, with your experience in many places around the world, which is really exciting because I feel like um, you and I are pretty similar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you see Melbourne in relation to nature protection and threats? Nature protection and what, sorry? And, and the threats that um, it's actually currently uh, experiencing. Like how do you see Melbourne like moving forward in terms of um, the nature protection is happening, you know, like the EPA sort of uh, pushed the bill uh, for next year. And how do you see that compared to other places around the world that you have seen? Um, I would say it's it's kind of a little bit in the middle. I mean, obviously, we're, we're one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, we're very privileged here. We have a lot of uh, amazing resources. Um, and so when I compare what is happening here to, for example, Europe, where I, so I'm from the Netherlands originally, and I remember being a kid and we already had four different bins to separate our waste into, right? So I kind of grew up with that. And when I came to Australia, I was quite shocked to see that, um, you know, businesses are not even recycling, like most of them. So it's like um, the waste systems here are very, very different. And in, in, in one sense, I feel like it's still a little bit behind on that, mm. on Northern Europe. However, like you, if you travel the world and you go diving in beautiful places, um, that also opens your eyes to the reality. So, you know, I've lived in South Africa for a while and uh, travel extensively through Southeast Asia uh, on a shoestring <laughs> everywhere. And um, yeah, compared to those places where waste management and waste systems are not set up or as developed as they are here in Australia, uh, they are they really have a problem at the moment mm. and it's really interesting to converse with waterkeepers from other places because sometimes when we um, we think that you know Melbourne still has a long way to go or Australia in general and we look at these microplastics which are a problem 
um, <laughs> when I speak to some of my interns or students or water keepers from other countries and they look at the data and they're like, you guys don't have a problem. <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> you guys are doing pretty well. So it really is all relative. And sometimes when I get a little bit depressed with all these numbers, I think about how well we're actually doing uh, compared to some other places in the world. So mm. yeah, I try to <laughs> I try to cheer myself up a little bit when I, uh, when I have my head in the data like that. Yeah, I agree with you. I have seen it like in South America as well. And it's shocking the amount of plastics that people just check out of the window in the car. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, compared to most places, we're doing pretty well here. Mm. But there's always room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and how do you see citizen science playing a role in sustainable development in the coming future? Um, I think it's essential. Um, I see citizen science as not only a way for uh, environmental uh, research to happen on a much larger scale and to gather much larger data sets over a broader geography than would be possible if we would only be you and me or a small team of people. Mm. Um, it's not just that, but it's also the avenues that citizen science opens for the participants in it. Um, so if, if volunteers participate in citizen science activities, they, also, they are also active citizens. They're actively engaged in making the change that they want to see. Right. Um, so people who opt uh, to come and volunteer at the Ecocenter, for example, sorting microplastics, uh, they are sitting there in a lab, you know, with the headlamps on and these two dentist tools separating out microplastics from organic materials by eyesight. That's not a sexy volunteering, but they're doing it because they <laughs> because they know it's going to generate the change that they want to see. So citizen science really empowers people to use their free time and their skills um, to help be an active citizen and, and create positive change for the environment. So I think it's really valuable for that alone. That's it. I don't have any questions. So <laughs> thanks so much. But yeah, Great. like I agree with you. Like we even run like the bio blitz um, over biodiversity month and we had um, more than 600 submissions of fauna and flora, which was really exciting. So people are uh, watching different species like they haven't seen, like a honey eater around Mary Creek. So that was really exciting. But yeah, yeah I agree with you. Yeah. I think you're meant to be now interviewing the next person. Oh, oh yeah. it's my turn. Great. Oh, Anna. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you. Face to face on the ground. Yeah, no. Um, so I'm so excited to interview you because uh, we met, I think we met at the Port Phillip Bay Forum last year, didn't we? We did, goodness me. Yes. That was I, the first time. Audience and yes, I saw you and <laughs> a beautiful kind of connection started from there and here we are. Yeah, here we are now uh, in COVID times. It kind of gives me a little bit of anxiety thinking we were in this whole big forum with all these people on top of each other, right? <laughs> How the times have changed. Yeah, yeah, well, you just wade into it and um yeah yeah hmm. um so anna um you have a, you have such an interesting background because you 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 have a background in communications but also in consultancy and you uh and in languages as well so you are an expert in in english and you have taught many people um to speak english or uh speak english better um so what the first thing i'm wondering is how how does this kind of consultancy and communication um, skills that you have built over the last 20 years, how do you apply those to your work with the Abbotsford River Bankers? Mm, such a good question, Sam. Yes, I'm, I'm very aware. I've come from somewhere left and centre here. Um, it's all about how do, you, how do you have great relationships and how do you use those relationships to all of us get where we want to go? Pretty much as simple as that. And of course, that all feeds back into not the way that just the way that we um, we lead and we we drive the vision, but also how we put that into practical action and how you you manage that, how you strategically manage that, how you manage it on the ground over time. Um, and also how you put into place something, and again, that's that's communications, um, but how you can put into place something that you know will just keep on going and keep that vision going and keep. Um, keep your mission going, you know, when you're gone, basically. Um, so 
by by folding in that that sort of that that teaching and that mentoring and that that tutoring and that coaching and um the language use and the language sharing and the sharing of the story you know you sort of fold all of that in um to that that mission that we all share and to practical action onto the ground and to knowing that that will still keep clocking on long after we've gone um so yeah i think there's commonality among all of us about that but that's particularly what i what i bring to the bring to the work that i do and what i hope will um will make a difference over yeah. time over time never ending yeah that's lovely and um you sent through a a list of sort of like quotes that uh and and thoughts that you've had about you know doing your work there and this actually the one that stood out was when you said this isn't about me or about being eco heroes. It's about building on systems and practices that work and keep going after we're all gone. I thought that was um, really beautiful. I, uh, I wrote it down. So, so in that vein, you spent a lot of time outside <laughs> on the riverbanks uh, with your hands in the mud. And uh, some of those places where you go are really well visited by, by people who do their recreation there and come to the Yarra River to enjoy uh, the beauty uh, and the tranquility and the connection with the water. Um, what, what sort of conversations do you have with passers-by? Because I can imagine people would, you know, stop and ask questions about what you're doing when you're digging out weeds and, you know, you've got some grass in your hair and um, uh, planting uh, new beautiful vegetation. So, so what are the more, um, do you have any memorable conversations that you've had with people or, or insights or interesting questions? How much fun have we got? Because, yeah, I well, before COVID, it was up to 2,000 people and their vehicles passing up and down the main city trail every day. And we know that that's multiplied during COVID. So our experience is all, it's all about the conversation. I put that in my notes as well, I think. Um, so yeah, constant, constant, constant conversation. Um, so what are the more memorable ones? Um, <laughs> They tend to be, and you know, we are we are women here talking about women leadership. Um, so you have had some sort of interesting conversations, maybe with, with guys um, who um, have an opportunity maybe to share their ecological knowledge, which I'm um, much a babe in the woods with, and I've got a lot to learn. Um, but they tend that there's a lot of um, picking holes in what we're doing. And there's a lot of um, finding the weak link in what we're doing. Um, and just some funny stuff that comes out of that. So, for instance, um, oh, you know, hello, here we are doing our work while you're having a bit of a look at our plants that we planted there a number of months ago. And this is what we're doing and this is how long it's taken. And it's taken us, you know, three years of constant weeding many times a week to get this place to a base, state of basic planting readiness. But isn't this great and exciting? Look at how they're growing. And then I'll have, yeah, but look at that one down there. It's not looking very healthy, is it? Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, um, that one we actually planted two weeks ago. So, you know, I can't wait till a couple of months in the future to look like that really happy one, just a couple of metres over. So that's always a fun kind of conversation. Or look at all this Madeira vine that we've gradually cleared over time or sort of how we've addressed erosion in this place. Yeah, but what about down there? Um, or I might be out in the middle of summer, 40 degrees heat with a bottle in my hand, watering one tree violet or something like that. And we'll get the kind of, it's not going to get very far with that bottle of water, are you? And I'll sort of silently point to my partner standing in the shade with a trolley full of bottles of water. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot of fun, but there's, there's a lot of, um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that question. That's a really, really important question. So, yeah, there's a little bit of a wry smile in there sometimes. Um, mm. but, you know, there's, there's always good intention. There's always goodwill. And there, it's always an opportunity to keep us, um, what's the word I want? Um, keep us accountable. Keep us bastards honest and help us refine our pitch and do better what we do. So it, it's a couple of examples, but we get lots of fun things like that. Um, but there's just a lot of, you know, good on you guys as someone cycles past. That's fantastic work. Um, what are you doing? Um, and then they might stop and we have a conversation about that. So there might be someone in yeah. the box. It might be um, a lady, a mum and dad with their toddlers 
now what's that lady doing oh she's doing gardening can I help too then we stop and have a conversation about it and you know and and it spreads and that might talk about you know how you in, engage with our riverland and that sort of plugs back into what you've already been talking about fam and I think this will be a common theme emerging in the evening about the quality of your engagement with our environment and our riverlands so you know it, it's not just about going and measuring something it's not just about going and picking up a, a bottle or whatever it's not just about sticking a plant in the ground you know you can do all that stuff but if you're you're treading um, with an unheeding eye in these delicate riverlands and we are in a thin 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 degraded bit of riverland which is not a managed park um, you know, we, we don't have much scope for making mistakes. So it is all about those conversations leading to change mindsets, change behaviours. How do you have a better quality of engagement with your riverland? And how do you get a better quality of volunteering, indeed, in the groups that we, that we manage, that we help to manage, that we run, run that we begin? Um, so, yeah, those conversations will help. Yeah, and I think those are important conversations to have because often those those people you know they wouldn't have stopped and really looked at the plants or really looked at the river um, if you hadn't been there and you know willing to have that conversation about what you're doing and why um, and I think we really underestimate that even those five minute conversations can actually really open people up people's eyes and and just change their connection to the land and the water just that tiny little bit you know so I think those engagements are, are really important that you're having do I have time for another question? I'm not sure how, how I'm being timed or not. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll just be doing the questions towards the end. Uh, so Anna can start interviewing Louisa if there's, there is another time for questions if you want, if you can ask another question through Anna, that there's time for that, yeah. Okay, yes, that's what I wanted to know because I could talk with Anna about this forever. But um, yeah, yeah no, so, no. so the last question I wanted to ask you, Anna, is um, do you have any thoughts because we, you know, this is a, a seminar on, on female leadership. What do you think women specifically bring to the table in, in water protection and protection of the waterways and looking after the environment? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think a particular quality of empathy. Um, so um, empathy and lack of it is, is not gender specific. Yeah, perhaps a, a particular quality of empathy and maybe a willingness to to share a certain receptivity I think um, and maybe uh, yeah a, a less a less sort of inbuilt need perhaps to to tell people what to do just sort of to um, maybe to allow people to, to do their thing and just sort of sit back and then um, yeah um, open up an opportunity for them to make refinements and then make adjustments and change behaviours over time. So I think that's a really important quality that we bring to what we do. Um, I think the, um, my mentioning about, it's not about me, <laughs> it's not about being eco heroes. And then again, that's not sort of gender specific, the kind of heroism thing. And I have very specific ideas about that and appreciate that not everybody would share them. But I think the, it's not about me thing is a particular quality that we do bring. You know, it, it is about those networks. It is about the relationships that we have, you know, with our teams, with, with, with our community, um, with our partners, you know, with you guys, with, yeah, with Mary Creek Management Committee, with Yarra Council, with Past Victoria and the, the, the people in those. So I think we do bring a particular quality of relationship and sharing to that. Yeah, and that that is, that, that makes a material difference in this sort of complex, difficult thing that we are working with. Um, and that it just need to go, needs to go on and on and on, you know, when we're long gone. That is a quality that I hope continues to make the difference that we yeah. certainly bring. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thanks, Anna, that was great. Good to hear your thoughts. No worries, fam, thank you. Oh, uh, and Neha, shall I? Um... Um, Anna, you have to interview now, I like your person. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello, Louisa. Lovely to um, possibly meet you for the first time. I think so. We may have had 
email <laughs> um, interactions. I know some questions came at one stage from the Abbotsford River Bankers. So, but gee, I'm a bit hazy. I'm really sorry about that, Anna. It is a bit like that, isn't it? Yes, we, um, we passed some people apparently volunteered with us the other day and they knew my name and they knew when they volunteered and I'm, gosh, yeah, I'm really, I'm afraid of having a hazy moment. So <laughs> not at all. Well, Louisa, um, as far as you're concerned, you represent standing on the shoulders of giants. You, you have been um, leading the way for so many years. So um, my questions are maybe a, an invitation for you to reflect on your, your leadership over time and the changes that you've seen, perhaps in the quality of, 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 of leadership and what kind of a difference it's making to changes in how a river corridor is, is improving as rehabilitating or not as the case may be. Wow, that's a massive, a good but massive question. And I think you, when you said standing on the, on the shoulders, I think I've been incredibly fortunate Although I started with Mary Creek Management Committee 18 years ago, the organisation's been going for 30 years and it was preceded by uh, a, a similar but um, organisation with no paid staff that had been going for about a, another 15 years. So there's a huge, huge amount of um, accumulated um, community knowledge in both practical um, ecological restoration processes in community engagement processes and in the pretty important skill of how you set up and run organizations. So uh, sustainable governance practices and building cultures that help to keep positive cultures that keep organizations going. So I, um, I think I, I just, I was incredibly fortunate to come into an organisation that was already fairly mature in that, in those respects. And I shouldn't say I haven't done anything. That's not what this session's supposed to be about. Uh, but there's just been enormous um, support and willingness um, from other staff, from past staff, from our committee of management, and, and from all the volunteer groups, and I guess especially the Friends of Mary Creek, which is uh, just, I guess, to explain to those of you that may not know, and sorry, I'm meandering now, but our structure is that we are an organisation whose members are other organisations. Uh, and the, that includes the six local councils that make up the catchment of the Mary. Um, plus two community groups with the Friends of Mary Creek being the, the key um, driver group. So I, it's an interesting question whether the way in which I work or we as a, a Mary Creek collective work, whether that's changed in the last 18 years. I probably need longer than the few moments now to um, to properly reflect on that but I think I'd say there's I guess there's an there's an increasing recognition across across many organizations perhaps across society about the importance of collaboration especially when we were working with these um, complex problems or some people call them wicked wicked problems anyway whatever terminology you want to use that that it's not, if we're going to improve um, our environment and really grapple with uh, incredibly serious environmental problems, uh, we, we have to work collaboratively in every way we can across um, so many different sectors. And over time, Louisa, you will have people and groups come and go. You have the paid element employees. You also have you know, big communities of volunteers, and of course, you have your different stakeholders, your, your many councils, your Mount Victoria, your Melbourne Water. So perhaps um, you might speak to how you manage to, to lead in, in um, driving, how these groups sign up, I suppose, to, to that culture 
and and agreed to obviously the common vision, but but agreed way in which you do it on the ground. So you have you implement that into practice and keep it consistent across groups because you do need that consistency and able to keep driving mm. the into the future. So could you speak to that a little? <laughs> That's another really um, interesting question that I'm sure an outsider could answer uh, with more acuity than I can. Um, but I think there's a huge amount to be said by um, learning and sharing by doing. So that the actual the, the the practice of what um, what you're doing and, and in a sense leading by. Um, more than demonstrating, but just just doing what you're doing, inviting other people to join in um, with the doing, um, building up trust is obviously um, incredibly um, important when you're working with other partner agencies and 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 with the community um, and the the I guess demonstrate that yes, the plants did we did it this way and yes the plants survived um they didn't all die i mean that's a that's a very small example but you you really need to be able to um well we all hope that what we're doing will survive <laughs> um whether it's biological or, or community but um it, it's really good to be able to show that things have worked well and and admit the failures too and um and learn from those and and share that information i'm not i feel like i've gone off the track from your question somewhat but um no no not at all um so um i had a question about volunteers and i'm afraid it's gone out of my mind um that's but, but how do you sort of um no, it's completely gone from my mind. I'm a favor Louisa. Let me just refer to my notes. Um, yeah, so we are talking about um, sort of continuity and quality. Um, obviously, I work only with volunteers, and you again work with um, paid employees and a group of volunteers, but it is a very dynamic environment of people. So, how do you manage to keep that continuity when you have people coming and going? Mm, I, I think that's um, uh, a really important consideration. It, it's important. It's easy to say that's incredibly important for volunteers, but it's important for staff too because you uh, staff leave, you know, come and leave for all sorts of uh, reasons. We've been incredibly lucky that quite a few of our staff have many of our staff stay for quite a long time. Uh, there's not a big turnover. I, I think that reflects the, the quality of the working environment and the culture of the workplace that people feel committed and feel it's a good place to work. So that, that's really important to build up. Um, it helps if you've got stable funding. I absolutely understand that if you've just got money for a particular project, and then that money runs out, that project officer hasn't got a job. Um, and you know, that, that's a huge challenge when you're running, well, any organisation really, not just a not for any business, any, any, anyone, um, yeah, not just not for profits. So I think we're, you know, in a way we've just, we've been really fortunate to have the buy-in from our member councils who provide a really fundamental, really important um, funding that enabled, has enabled us to weather fairly well some of the other ups and downs and therefore provide continuity of employment for staff. Um, for, for volunteers, uh, hmm. uh, again, we there are, I'm sure anyone who's worked with volunteers knows that they're, uh, they're, they're all amazing and there is an amazing sector of volunteers with the Merry, but I'm sure also with the Birrarung and uh, Port Phillip Bay and anywhere we like to think of who have been doing this work on a voluntary basis for years and years, decades and decades sometimes, but who are, um, 
generous people and who are able to mentor um, and keep keep vibrant their organisations. It doesn't always happen like that. I don't think I couldn't pretend to understand what that, what really sustains some volunteer organisations as opposed to others. That's that's really complex. Um, I think. The Friends of Mary Creek often say, I don't think they'll mind me trying to represent their views. They've said it's been incredibly important for them and their continuity to have a professional, professional staff and a professional organisation like Mary Creek Management Committee that takes a lot of the load off them in terms of administrative detail, even the, the chasing of grants and lets them focus on the things that they really want to do, whether that's um, uh, getting involved in on-ground works, uh, getting involved with planning and issues and advocacy, or getting involved with citizen science. So um, they, yeah, yeah, look, at that's more for them to say, but I've said it for them um, because I've heard them say that. But then there's a really, really delicate balance that I'm sure everyone has um, would be aware of between, oh, okay, so the staff who are being paid to do this, but here am I, I'm a volunteer, and, and you are, Anna, I think, completely volunteer. I'm doing the same work and I'm not getting paid for it. And there is potential there for some friction. Um, I don't think in our case, in our case, really unfortunate, I'm largely not aware of that um and I don't I don't know I don't know I don't know what the answer uh, you know I don't know I can't sensibly say how we manage that balance except that one has to have um empathy um uh use your intuition be respectful you know I mean, all of those things that are are needed whether you're working with people as volunteers or working with other um your own staff or colleagues from other workplaces. Mm. So perhaps that answers, I'll make this my concluding question and the threat of women in leadership. Um, but I think you've perhaps answered part of the question of what is it that women particularly bring to these roles and you've mentioned empathy. So perhaps you'd like to speak briefly to that. Oh, well, look, I was listening carefully to what you, was, you were saying because you got answer, asked, I think, a, a very similar question and, and I don't want to try and claim that there are particular qualities that in particular individuals can be separated by, um, by gender. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's, there are you know, if you, oh, I won't get into into social science, um, I don't. Uh, um, it's very very hard to reflect on one's um, one's own style or even uh, more generally the style of women leaders in waterways or women leaders more. Generally, I, um, mm, um, <laughs> well, I'm sure we can all think of some terrible um, women leaders and terrible men leaders, and um, there are probably some terrible non-binary leaders as well. Um, <laughs> but no, sorry, I don't. I don't mean to mean to trivia, trivialize. Um, the question I just find it very hard to um, answer without going into generalities that aren't necessarily the case when you get to specific people. Mm. I think that we can all agree on the panel that none of us desires to make generalities of that kind we certainly observe certain qualities but yes you can ascribe it to to any sex or any group um, so I think I think that's appreciated, and we're delicately, um, yeah, we're, we're we're treating that delicately. So happy to leave it with that. Thanks, Louisa. Thanks. I'm sorry I couldn't be more specific about that. Um, and I think I need to start asking Karen some questions.
Hi, Lisa. Hi. Um, I was, uh, this is, I should, we should let everyone else know this is the first time I've met you. Um, and I saw from your bio that you're originally from Chile. Yes. And I thought, oh, gee, that's interesting. I wonder what rivers in Chile are like. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. So, uh, and I don't know whether you were interested in rivers when you were, <laughs> when you were living in, in growing up in Chile, but could you speak about that? Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Santiago, but I used to live more in the countryside, um, like 40 minutes south of the city. And I spent my five, um, well, my first five years of my life living in Patagonia as well. So we had lots of rivers, mm. lots of glaciers. Um, you got the whole Andes mountain range, which is basically a whole range full of waterfalls, rivers and waterways. So always um, kind of close contact to the rivers and waterways. Um, and my background before getting involved with the whole environmental um, studies. Um, I'm actually a wildlife vet, so I was always in touch with nature and conservation and, and all that. It just happened that eventually I got in, in the water, um, started diving, and that's how I got involved with water um, protection and conservation. Mm. And then you ended up here in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. definitely a river that's not <laughs> glacier influenced, even though it's influenced by many other things. Yeah, I also um, uh, was fascinated um, about the plastic runner, which you founded, and plogging. And I'm, I'll have to admit my ignorance that I hadn't heard of either until I, I, I read your bio and I looked up a few things. But can you tell us a bit more about that and the genesis of it? How? What inspired you to um, establish the plastic um, runner? I think coming from the same place from um, as fam, um, when I was diving back in 2015, working in the Great Barrier Reef, I experienced the whole plastic pollution issue. I was diving against litter, um, picking up plastics. And um, when I moved to Melbourne, I realized it was too cold to dive as much as I did back in Queensland. Oh. <laughs> um, so I, I got back into my running because um, I love running. I have been running for things like being nine years now, um, just doing lots of trail running, running around the mountains, national parks and things. And I started finding myself that I was picking up a lot of plastics and I, I was getting a bit upset that I could see like all these little like national parks or um, really beautiful places being impacted in the same way as the ocean was. So I sort of transitioned that um, plastic collection from the ocean into the national parks and trails. Um, and it happened that I was training for a 100 um, kilometer race. Um, wow. So I was, I was running a lot around the Yarraven Park and I find myself picking up a lot of plastics and it's like, you know what, I'm just going to do something about this because uh, it, I was kind of realizing that it was hard for parks big and council to access those places to actually retrieve the plastic. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna organize an event, um, invite a couple of friends that they do the same thing as me, and we're gonna see how we go. I have to say, we found so much, so much in just two hours that I was shocked that the Yarra Bend being looking such a really pristine place, it was just flooded with litter. Um, so then I started running events every month, um, in a way to pay my entry to use the park, even if it's a free access park. I was just, well, you know what? I really like this park. I'm just gonna give a bit back to it. Um, and yeah, that's how it, eventually people started coming to the events. Um, I saw an opportunity there and it, it was just, you know what? I'm just gonna keep doing this and I'm gonna give it a name. And then I realized it actually had a name and that was blogging and it sounded better than me running with a bag. Um, so yeah, that's that's what happened, and it's been two and a half years now. Um, we have run more than thirty events, and we have picked up over one thousand kilos of rubbish, which is really exciting. I mean, it doesn't sound as much, but when you're talking about national parks or um, just local trails, it, it does create some impact. 
No, it's, you've clearly inspired lots of people to um, join, which is terrific. I'm just a very slight diversion. We're going to be soon, ex we, as in at Mary Creek, exploring pluding. That's a variant on plogging, um, and it's it's collecting um, rubbish whilst bird watching. Oh, nice. So we'll be having. Um, we're hoping to have a webinar on that from someone from the US uh, where plurting is a thing. Mm. I mean, you don't have to run 100K. Like, no, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> That's really good yeah. to know because I know I couldn't. I don't think I ever could have, and especially not now. Um, Karen, you're now the um, head of operations for the Yarra River Keepers Association. Would you... Um, and when I saw that, I thought, oh, wow, you know, river keepers have got a head of operations. I wonder what that means. So could you tell us? Um, yeah, so it was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't really expecting this year to happen, especially with the pandemic. Um, it's been really challenging, but also it's been really fun. So I have always liked projects, and I think the Plastic Runner was my first way to explore experience the whole thing of running a little organization of just uh, basically a one girl all, all sort of trades um, getting involved with volunteers council park speak and different organizations as well so when I got offered the position um, and then corona hit us in just one week I had to move everything online and do the whole onboarding online so as you can imagine Andrew was just having a bit of a meltdown, just thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, luckily, um, I'm very like te um, tech friendly, so we were pretty okay. But basically what my role is at the moment, it's um, coordinating all the teams, what's been happening in the ground. Um, of course, everything is online right now. So um, we built up a volunteer program, which is really exciting because before that, we didn't have that. So at the moment, I think we up to 18 core volunteers um, volunteering with us in different things as social media, marketing, projects, um, community engagement and so on. So that's really exciting. Um, then we got the internship program and the first part of it. So with um, Monash and Melbourne Uni, which is really exciting. So we have three students and they're working in different projects around, um, well, river management and also green accounting. So, it's, it's a bit of a mix between um, running budgets, running timelines, um, coaching the team to make sure they're actually doing okay, especially right now in this challenging times. And it's been really rewarding to see how um, my experience with my little project, it's kind of working right now for a bigger purpose. So yeah, I think that's, that's yeah. a whole thing. Oh, well, look, um, that's um, a huge, tribute to you and the others that are working with you to uh, take on so many new staff and new initiatives at a time when you can't meet um, yeah, face to face. Oh, look, it, I'll admit, yeah. I, I kind of shied away from that. Um, yes, just thought we've got enough on our plates just coping with all of the staff and the things we're doing now, let alone taking on I would have had it really actually had a meltdown, I think, not just, you know, you said Andrew was threatening <laughs> to have a meltdown. So, uh, yeah, it's really impressive to hear. Um, I think I've got, have I got time for one last question, which um, um, just wondering where, whether in, say, 10 or so years' time you'd see yourself still um, would you still hope to be working in the waterways space? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, once I went diving the first time, that, that was it. I had my connection with waterways. Um, I think, that, yeah, she's, she's smiling. Yeah, she knows. Uh, <laughs> um, eventually, uh, my purpose in life, I think I, I want to be connected with water. Either it's the Yarra, it's the ocean, because um, whatever comes from the Yarra is going to end up in the ocean anyway. Um, but yeah, because that's going to be linked to everything. So without water, we, we, we just nothing. If we don't have healthy waterways, we're not going to have a healthy ecosystem. We, we can't have healthy corridors or healthy habitats. So water is basically everything. Um, and even me being a vet, I can see that happening in the ground with animals. Um, back, back in the day when I did volunteer, 
for few organizations in Costa Rica. Um, so yeah, like I think water, it's pretty exciting. I don't think many people is aware of how important it is. Um, but once you put your um, scuba dive equipment on and you go diving, even in, the, in a river, you can go diving and you see many things. Um, yeah, oh, you, even, you get even, hooked up and yeah. you can't you can't leave. Yeah, well, look, even for me, in a way, it started, if I can slightly indulge, um, on a first date, and this person happened to be a freshwater ecologist, and um, we went um, to one of the upper Yarra tributary streams to do some sampling. That was the date. <laughs> um, and um, turning over rocks and looking at um, macro invertebrates, mayflies, stoneflies, all these amazing little critters that um, have an aquatic part of their lifestyle. I didn't know they existed. That's right. It was That's um, just That's extraordinary. <laughs> Yeah, that's such a really good idea for a date. What Sorry? a great, great date. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So did it work out? Oh, it did work out for a while and that person's still yeah. um, a good friend. But no, it didn't. wasn't the beginning of a 45-year 40 40 year relationship. Most <laughs> of a different kind. Uh, do we have any time for like the questions now? We do have time for one question, unfortunately, not a lot, but there are some really good questions in the panel. Uh, before that, I would really like to thank our panelists for a person that's like a young woman just like me and just coming into the water management and environmental protection. This has been quite inspirational and really, I, it was really insightful for me. Um, so yeah, let's dive into our first question by Tiffany Scott. She said, uh, she says, I work for a local council and litter collection, collection initiatives often don't have a clear leader. As a community development worker, how would you suggest I justify leading a group of litter collection volunteers? Uh, does anyone want to take that? Well, I think Karen has the most experience with uh, uh, picking Later. up and just starting out of nowhere. <laughs> Do you want to take that, Karen? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think when you engage with community in terms of leader collection, you have to have a really um, like a constant contact with them. Um, has to be consistent because if if it's just a one-off um, event or opportunity, it actually doesn't really happen that people get engaged in a longer-term commitment. Um, I think I suggest creating groups on Facebook. It's pretty easy and it's a really uh, blog cost way to engage with people in a, like a longer term project. Um, so you can set up a, a Facebook group. Um, for example, Anna Richway probably has a few um, insights in terms of how she leads her community group as well. It doesn't need to be related to leader. I think it's just how you engage with a, a group of volunteers. So um, Anna, how, how do you actually engage with your group of volunteers? on the ground through Instagram and through Facebook and obviously through our website. Um, you know, on the ground, I cannot emphasise how important it is just to be there. And, you know, I've talked a lot about the conversation, but that, that really is what it is and that you seem to be doing the same thing. You are consistent, you are persistent, you are patient, you are open, you, um, you are humble. Um, and you, uh, you, you have that vision um, and you have that clarity of purpose. And you, that is fed into every single message you put out on social media, that is fed into every single activity you have. You feed that into every single conversation um, and you, you just continue and you grow and you reinforce that over time. And, you know, and again, you, in doing so, you gradually earn the right to do what you do so you don't get out in there on the ground and immediately you're an expert or a hero or you've got the right to get $20,000 worth of grants, funding, or whatever it may be, that's pretty much how you do it. And that's, that, that, that goes into that leadership question, whoever you are, whatever your gender, it is absolutely at the heart of it. Whether it's, sorry, should I say, whether it's plogging or um, long-term management of the river corridor in that sort of, um, in, in, in just, in the middle space between land and water, so where it all comes together, same principles. Mm. Yeah, so I yeah, think and, the, and the main, sorry, um, the main key message I think is consistency, I guess. 
Yeah, and, and Tiffany, uh, in a more practical way, I think as a community development worker, you are excellently placed uh, to lead community or to to lead uh, litter cleanups because it is a way for people to connect with each other as well. So if you have the opportunity to take out, for example, you know the same group once a fortnight or every week or something like that. Um, and I think a way to justify it, especially if you need to justify it to local council to spend your time on that, um, at the Eco Center, we have developed a street litter audit method that is really easy to do, especially with a small group of, of, of volunteers where you, um, you audit and collect the data of the litter that you find on a very specific uh, street uh, or, or park or a sport ground or a river bank or any particular uh, place and the more of those litter collections you do and the more data you collect the more insights you get in what the problems are for littering and we are using uh, the data that we have gathered from about 500 cleanups all around Melbourne that Scout Victoria uh, have done with us um, that data is being used to actually inform local councils about where the litter hotspots are in their council and what the problematic items are and that will lead to thinking about what source reduction initiatives can you take to minimize those problematic items uh, in the first place. So, so the data collection that you can do can benefit council as well um, for their, their waste management practices. So that would be a way to, to justify it. And feel free to contact me at the Eco Center and I can get you the data sheets that have all the instructions on it. I, I oh, sorry, Anna. Um, I agree with Fam. Um, I actually had a bit of a work with City of Yarra and uh, we run a few events with the waste audits as well, and we reported to them what, what were the issues in terms of well, what are the waste streams that you're experiencing, you know, is this actually a hotspot that um, could justify having the installation of a bin on that place. And all those sort of insights, they help the council to use resources for better like cleanup collections, you know, a bin locations and, and all that. So yeah, it is really important. Um Hotel Deco Centre, um, fun. that reminds me of why I, I was so attracted to the way you guys do things and I wanted to speak to you, was because you have that absolutely outstanding matrix that you developed last year. Was last year? I think it was. Yeah, 2019, yeah. Exactly. Seems ages ago now. <laughs> um, but this is just so important to, you know, to, to be able to drive exactly what you guys have been talking about. So I do highly recommend you guys go and have a look on their website. Um, and use those resources um, to accompany what you may do. Um, it is important, it is robust, it is easy to use. It's not complicated, but it is really, really, really robust. Um, so, yeah, I do highly recommend that. Thanks, Anna. And I, I did see that you uh, also are hosting the, the rubric on your website of Abbotsford River Banker. So that's excellent. Thank you, Slowly Anna. spreading it out through the city. <laughs> uh, look, um, we have had to take it back because and, and again back to leadership stuff happens so you do have to wind back on some of those initiatives that you start with with you know a bang and they don't end up being a whimper but you need you do need to prioritize certain things so at the moment we are we are treading water on that but yeah it, it is there and ready to take up again when the time is right yeah uh yeah thank you so much for that that was really helpful and uh, to wrap up this discussion panel, I would like to just quote someone from the comment section, Mary Allen, who said that it was once said that if you educate a man, you educate an individual, but if you educate a woman, you educate a family. So that is pretty nice. And, and that's how we're going to wrap this evening's discussion panel. So thank you again to all the panelists. And thank, I, you. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah, any any un answer questions that are going to be answered. So don't worry if we didn't answer them like right now. We will share them later. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Lovely to meet you all. Bye.